Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. This week's guest is Columbia University history professor Matthew Connolly. He's the author of the new book, The Declassification Engine. Connolly is passionate about the problem of overclassification of government documents. He argues that the decades-old backlog of document review robs Americans of the ability to better understand our history. He believes too many documents are classified for reasons other than national security. He and colleagues at Columbia have spent 10 years building a declassification engine that searches unclassified federal documents, hoping to demonstrate a technology-based solution to this growing problem. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Matthew Connolly, author of The Declassification Engine, as someone who has been thinking about and researching document classification for more than a decade, are you surprised that we're in a situation in this country where we have a incidents involving a former president, former vice president, and the sitting president and classified documents? Well, I think the fact that all this somehow coincided with my book launch, it took me by surprise. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, more seriously, uh, I think that when you think about it, uh, what is at the bottom of all of these different incidents is that we have public officials, you know, who are doing the people's business, uh, keeping a record, or at least we hope they would, right, of the decisions that they make on our behalf, but somehow, you know, in the end, treating it as if it were their private property, right, and, and walking off with it. Now, in some cases, uh, they will say it was by mistake. Um, and maybe many cases they would be right. Uh, in other cases, like Donald Trump, for example, he's saying that these were his records all along. Uh, so there's some difference between these different cases. But the disturbing reality to me underlying all of them, you know, is that we are creating so many secrets as a society. Our government is creating tens of millions of secrets every year that we've lost the ability to keep track of even the most important secrets, right? The ones supposedly anyway classified top secret in the possession of the commander in chief. So if even records like that are, are not secure, then I think you have to ask yourself about the entire system and, and what's wrong with it. You're talking to us from your uh, place of employment, Columbia University, where you teach history. How did you as a historian get so involved in the whole question of classified documents? Well, I've been working with uh, declassified documents for a few decades now. I mean, since I started in graduate school in the early 1990s, anybody who wants to write about the history of American foreign relations, uh, you end up asking yourself, well, what can I get my hands on? Because you know that whether we're talking about international negotiations or you know covert operations, uh, American war plans, nuclear war plans, I mean, these are all topics that over the years I've, I've tried to do research on. And every single time, what you find is a lot of what you'd like to know is still classified. And when I started to look more closely at this about 10 years ago, what I found, for example, is that you know there are departments and agencies, the Pentagon, for example, the CIA, who even after 25 years, even after a quarter of a century, when they're supposed to, according to the president's own orders, they're supposed to automatically declassify this information. What you find in some cases, 90% of the time, is that they find some reason not to release this information. And what I realized 10 years ago is that they were starting to deal with the records from the 1970s, electronic records, that numbered in the millions. And I began to realize that there was a massive amount of information, in fact, you know, exponential growth in secret information that even historians like me were not allowed to see. Your book, and you referenced a couple of them, gives the readers a number of different stats that really outline the scope of this problem, the magnitude of the problem. So mm -hmm. would you outline it for our viewers today, the number of people that can classify documents, how many they're classifying, um, mm -hmm. how long it takes to go through the system, how much it costs, all of that? Yeah, well, the, the the period I was talking about just now, 10 years ago when I started out, in 2012, 
the government estimated that officials were classifying information 95 million times a year. That's three times every second. And the most recent information we have as to how many people have security clearances, well, it's 1.3 million people have a top secret security clearance. And there are millions more people who have security clearances to see material that's secret or confidential. So that's far more people than, than live in the District of Columbia. I'll give you just one other uh, citation or statistic rather. This too is from the government, it's from 2017. And that is five years ago, more than five years ago now, they estimated they were spending $18.4 billion every year trying to protect all these secrets. If that was one of our departments, it would be 50% bigger than the Department of the Treasury. And that was more than five years ago. Since then, the government has said that they can no longer even estimate how much money they're spending on secrecy, and they can't even estimate how many secrets they're creating every year. So where are all those documents? Well, a lot of these documents, we don't know whether they're classified or not. We do know the volume of material that's held in federal record centers. And if you added up all the cubic square feet of paper documents, it would add up to 26 Washington monuments. Now, a lot of that material is classified. And if you add it up, you know, how much is uh, being declassified every year, like of all those paper pyramids, you know, how many of them are getting released every year? Well, it amounts to half of the pyramid at the top of just one of those Washington monuments worth of cubic uh, square footage of, of paper, a lot of it classified, right? So it's really mind boggling, like both how much paper the government has, how much of it is classified, sometimes classified top secret, and how little of that ultimately re reaches the public. And Susan, just one other thing. So far, I've just been talking about paper records. We all know, of course, that the government is producing huge numbers of electronic records. The State Department produces 2 billion email a year. So 10 years ago, they estimated that one intelligence agency was producing a petabyte of classified information every single year. If that petabyte of data, if that was in paper form, if these were paper documents, classified documents in file folders, you put them in file cabinets, you would row, line up that row of file cabinets and it would circle the equator, right? So that's how much secret information we're talking about. And that's how little of it is, is reaching the public. How is the process supposed to work? Well, you know, it's, it's in the term automatic declassification. So decades ago, I mean, you can go back more than 60 years. Uh, the, we already had the idea that surely at some point, you know, maybe it's 25 years, maybe it's 40 years, maybe it's 50 years. But at some point, you know, the original reasons why you wanted to protect that information, whether because, you know, let's say it had information about an American weapon system, let's say it was about some covert activity or program. At a certain point, you, know, you have to realize that, you know, the need the American people have to know what the government does in their name, that need, that vital need outweighs the original concern about the security of that information. So there comes a point where most of us, I think, would agree that that older material, if it's 25 years or 40, or certainly if it's 50 or 60 years old, it ought to be released to the public. But unfortunately, that's not what's been happening because in the same executive order that a president can stipulate that he wants or he or she would you know, 25 year old or 50 year old records to be released, they will also itemize the various exemptions, the things that officials are allowed to keep secret even after decades have gone by. And that includes things that I think a lot of us would agree with. It's things to do with like the identity of covert operatives, right? If that information might have to do with how you build nuclear weapons or breed nuclear material, right? So there are certain exceptions that we can understand. But the problem is there are so many of them and human beings are using those exemptions and interpreting them that it turns out again that that tons of material never ends up getting released because at the end of the day this is a very human process these are individual human beings who are making these decisions and all of these people you know have spent their careers typically their careers in government only reviewing classified information they tend to be very very zealous in asserting you know, the need for national security and understating and undervaluing, in fact, you know, the need the American people have to hold their leaders to account. 
We uh, interviewed David Ferriero as he was leaving his post as the uh, National Archivist last year, and uh, have a clip from him talking about the volume that they are expected to process. So the first tranche was 400 million pages of classified material going back to World War I. And with a deadline of December 31st, 2000, I forget, a December 31st deadline, it gave us three years anyway to accomplish that. They need to pay attention to staffing levels across the executive branch. It's not just the National Archives. But FOIA is a good example. Every agency in the executive branch has a, a massive FOIA backlog, and it's because there aren't enough people dealing with the um, processing, coupled with the fact that the information technology infrastructure in the federal government is not what it should be. So we've got a couple issues there. We've got uh, volume, we've got staffing levels, and outdated infrastructure. Yeah, and uh, I, I think that's exactly the way to begin because, you know, all of our leaders, practically every single president, when they began office, they said that they were going to be more transparent and more accountable than their predecessor. But, you know, as our current president said back when he was running along with Barack Obama back in 2008, he said, don't believe it when people tell you, you know, that they value this or that. Look at their budget. Look at what it is they spend their money on. And, you know, I, I a moment ago said how it is that the government spends over $18 billion on keeping secrets. Well, this government spends only about $100 million. That's barely half of 1% on declassification. And you can look also at the budget of the National Archives. So the budget of the National Archives is less than $400 million. That might seem like a lot of money, but that's actually less than the cost of one stealth bomber. Right? The Pentagon has a budget of over $800 billion. Over $800 billion. The Pentagon spends more money on military bans than we spend on the US National Archives. Okay, so that gives you some sense about how much value as a society we place on preserving our national patrimony, right? The, the records going all the way back to the founders that we keep you know, to know what it is that leaders do in our name in order to study the past and try to avoid future mistakes. Now, I think that work is quite valuable. Like, I mean, wouldn't we have rather like learn the lessons of the past, learn some of the lessons from our military history, right, in order to avoid some of the disastrous wars and disastrous pullouts that we've seen in recent years. But it's not free. And in fact, the National Archives needs far more in the way of appropriations and new technology to deal with this colossal challenge that they're facing, which only grows year by year. In your book, and we'll talk more about the processes, but you talk about uh, reviewing documents that come from the presidential libraries. What's the relationship between the National Archives and then documents going to the various libraries? Question one. Question two, presidential libraries are changing as of Barack Obama, and what's the implication of that? Oh, yeah. So it's changing quite a lot. Uh, like, as many of your uh, viewers may know, uh, we have a system of presidential libraries begun by Franklin Roosevelt all the way up until Barack Obama. Every president you know, would have a place uh, where the papers from that administration would be deposited uh, and eventually reviewed and, and then made available to the public. Now, also, many times uh, the senior advisors, cabinet secretaries, others, they would leave their papers. They would also uh, collect oral histories. They would do interviews systematically over the years. And these presidential libraries were incredibly impressive and important sites of research because there, too, there would be trained archivists like who would spend, in some cases, decades working with the papers of Dwight Eisenhower. So a researcher like me or any member of the public, really, could show up and say, you know, I'm interested in, in Eisenhower and his farewell address. I'd like to hear more about this military industrial complex. Those archivists would then be able to tell you, like, well, here are the records that you should be looking at. Here are the, the finding aids. Here are the boxes where you can begin pouring through these one secret papers. That whole world is passing away, sadly, uh, because Barack Obama, it's not entirely clear, um, but what you can infer from the, the public information made available for the National Archives was that Barack Obama wasn't particularly interested in raising hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that it would cost you know, to create the Barack Obama Presidential Library. He was willing to raise money for a presidential center, 
right? That had a different mission, like an educational mission. But this mission, the one about research, right? And the accumulation of knowledge is something that unfortunately was left, you know, to the National Archives itself with its own resources. And what the National Archives decided was that they didn't want to support new presidential libraries. Um, they too thought it was too costly, right? And distracting um, in order to uh, to staff these libraries. And so what they've decided is that all of the classified material that was still remaining at these presidential libraries would be transported back to Washington. And so unfortunately, like this part of the National Archives system, really the jewels in the crown, I mean, these still are like some of the best parts of our National Archives system. Uh, there will be the last of their kind. And in fact, they're moving staff away so that, for instance, at the Lyndon Johnson Library, where I was a few weeks ago, they have stopped declassifying materials. They don't have anybody. They have one person left who by themselves is not authorized to review and release materials. So here we have records going back to the 1960s, the Vietnam War, the Great Society, where as members of the public or even historians or journalists, we have no ability anymore you know, to get those materials reviewed and released to us, even though they're more than 50 years old. A oh, very, very, uh, very detailed question, which what are the levels of classification and who can classify a document? Yeah, so, you know, if you look at these executive orders, uh, what they'll tell you is that, um, you know, only people who have original classification authority, and there are a couple of thousand of these people, they're the ones, you know, who are able to decide that a, a new program or a new technology you know, let's say it's some NSA hacking tool, or let's say it's some new stealth aircraft put out by the Air Force. They'll be the ones to decide this is a top secret program. And only people who have top secret security clearance are allowed to see it. And what that means when you read the language, it says that if that information were released, it would cause grave damage to the national security. Um, now, below that, you have secret uh, level of classification and you have confidential. But then, there are actually a lot of other rules, some of them unwritten rules that really determine the status of information in our um, in our government and whether it is uh, whether the public is going to be allowed to see it. So, for example, there's something called limited unclassified information, and there's an enormous volume of information that is not classified as national security information. But that doesn't mean you're allowed to see it. <laughs> actually, they they stamp you know tons of material as limited official use. Uh, in order uh, for them not to release it to the public. So this allows them then you know, to withhold that information to the, from the public unless they review it first and decide what can be released. There's also things called special access programs, SAPs. And it's estimated there are thousands of these programs. So let's say you're not satisfied. You've decided this particular covert operation is top secret, but you only want a small number of people to know about it. So you make it into a special access program. There's also like tons of information related to like signals intelligence when we intercept communications, whether it's email or voicemail or what have you. That is oftentimes intercepted by the National Security Agency and all that data uh, is data that they consider sensitive compartmented information, right? That you're supposed to only look at in a se secure compartmented information facility or a SCIF. Okay, so this is what leads some people to say like, well, there's, there's top secret, but then there's also top secret SCI, which is like a higher level. But I'm here to tell you, Susan, that you know, the people who go to great pains to tell you about all these elaborate rules and all their strict definitions, what they will tell you in all honesty is that what actually happens in government can be very different because you can have the most innocuous email classified at a top secret level. Conversely, you could have tens of millions of personnel records with the most sensitive information you can imagine about people who got security clearances. These are the investigation files where the FBI would record information about whether, for instance, they had substance abuse issues or gambling issues. All that information was kept in personnel records and tens of millions of those records were stolen by the Chinese government. Those records were not classified, even though they're incredibly sensitive. So the sad reality is, even though we have an incredibly elaborate system that is full of incredibly arcane rules, requires enormous amounts of, of training, you know, for everybody who's meant to participate in that system, what's really happening in that system can be incredibly chaotic. And the end result is, is obviously dysfunctional. Well, what is the relationship then, speaking of dysfunction, between this broken system and some of the big data dumps we've seen by activists over recent times, Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. So, you know, what we're seeing, a lot of people would say in government, people would admit that this is the logical result, right? Because if you classify everything, that at the end of the day, nothing is really safe. Now, this is something that works at a psychological level, right? Where, you know, even 50 years ago, the time of the Pentagon Papers case, when Daniel Ellsberg released that that's classified secret history of America's involvement in Vietnam, even then, people in the Nixon administration said that one of the problems was that all too much information was getting classified and it was leading people to be cynical as to whether that information was really dangerous and really did have to be protected. And so even 50 years ago, people were saying that one reason why even then we were having these massive leaks was because too much information was getting classified and people on the inside no longer believed it. They, they themselves didn't think that information was, was actually secret. And in the case of the, the Pentagon Papers, uh, they would have had a point. You know, because afterwards, Ellsberg would sometimes say, and I don't think he was wrong, that nobody could really point to any instances, even though that was all top secret. Nobody could point to examples in which uh, American servicemen were put in danger, where the United States really paid a price, right, because of the leak of that information. And clearly, many people learned an enormous amount, right, about how the United States first got involved in that disastrous war and only learned that because that information came out uh, through that, that leak by Daniel Ellsberg. Now, these more recent leaks, um, you know, I, I think that they are different in nature. For one thing, they're even bigger, right? Ellsberg had to Xerox everything page by page. In the case of Chelsea Manning, you know, he could burn, you know, those quarter of a million records to a DVD, right? Or even a CD uh, disc and walk out with it. So, so it's a different uh, in nature, uh, in, in the nature of the data itself. These are electronic records, um, which in some ways makes them even more useful, right? For data mining purposes compared to the paper documents that Ellsberg leaked. Um, but in other ways, I think um, if you look at the, the average quality, you know, in terms of the informational content of these records, the vast majority of the records that came out through WikiLeaks were just not that interesting. I mean, it gives you a sense of the quality of secrecy. The fact that so much of what gets classified as secret, as thousands of those those uh, cables did in the case of WikiLeaks, a lot of that so-called secret information is, is not actually secret. A lot of it was already publicly known. And even journalists soon enough got tired of, of reporting stories out of, out of WikiLeaks because there really just weren't that many stories to report. We have a clip from 2015 of Julian Assange, and here he's talking about Hillary Clinton's emails. Let's watch this. It's a uh a ridiculous overclassification and um, it's not surprising to me uh, that she has been swept up in absurd over overclassification uh, uh, scandals. It's very unlikely that there's anything in Hillary's emails that could be genuinely classified now. By genuinely classified I mean according to what's in the law about classifications, uh, information which would threaten the security, the genuine security of a significant fraction of the population of the United States. Matthew Connolly, I wanted to use that clip not just to talk about Hillary Clinton per se, but you also report that it's not, uh, she's not the only one. Colin Powell was a big user of personal email uh, on p official business, and uh, there have been allusions to other government officials who have used personal email. What is the impact? Well, first of all, what drives public officials to circumvent the system, and what's the impact on us knowing our history as a result? But the case of Colin Powell, in some ways, uh, some ways it's even worse uh, than with Hillary Clinton because uh, he later said that he didn't keep any of his email. <laughs> so, and in fact, it was it was Colin Powell who's the one who told Hillary Clinton uh, that this was a system that she should use. She should use her own email service uh, because he said the government systems were just too awkward to deal with, um, too difficult. Um, now, you know, it's well known, notorious that government IT systems can often be extremely uh, inconvenient. Uh, you know, there are cases, for example, uh, there was an American ambassador uh, who was reported multiple times. He ended up uh, doing his email from his phone, uh, from a stall in the bathroom at the embassy. So, you know, there are examples of, of officials going to some lengths, you know, to avoid legal requirements, you know, of, of keeping records. But the reason why we insist on it and we have to is because otherwise, you know, just think of it, 
Um, you know, on a day to day basis, uh, our secretary of state, you know, the head of our uh, Pentagon, et cetera, the National Security Council, they are conducting business on behalf of the American people, international negotiations like trade agreements. Um, they're also carrying out covert operations. We have a very large, like targeted assassination program. I mean, these are life and death decisions. And, you know, these trade agreements and so on, they, they could mean, you know, prosperity or poverty for, for millions of Americans. So we need to know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, if we can know in real time, and, you know, of course we can, right? If they're international negotiations, you know, they have to be able to conduct them uh, with some degree of, of uh, confidentiality. So if we can know it in real time, then we at least need to know it eventually, right? At least historians at the end of the day ought to be able to know what decisions these leaders have made in our name. And if, you know, whether it's Colin Powell or Hillary Clinton or, you know, the Republican officials during the George W. Bush administration who used Republican National Committee email, you know, or it's the case of Donald Trump or maybe even Joe Biden walking off with, with records that belong to the American people. In all these cases, we find increasingly public officials are contemptuous or at the least neglectful of their legal responsibility to keep a record. It is the most basic responsibility of all, but more and more we see officials not respecting that that responsibility. So now that we've spent some time outlining the scope of the problem, this book is also about you and your colleagues' attempt get to get a handle on this through the use of data. It's a project mm -hmm. called the, uh, the History Lab and specifically the declassification engine that you've built. Tell me about it. Yeah, so really it's a platform uh, where we've aggregated as many declassified documents as we could get our hands on. Uh, we're approaching some 5 million records, uh, mainly United States records, um, especially from the State Department, the Pentagon, the Central Intelligence Agency. But increasingly, we're collecting two uh, records of international organizations and alliances uh, like NATO, uh, UN Secretaries General, the World Bank. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to aggregate, you know, as much information as we possibly can. And then we're building tools to analyze uh, this data and discover things that we wouldn't know otherwise. Uh, and so this isn't usually how history works. You know, usually it's more like what I described where you go to a presidential library, you might be interested in a particular topic and archivists will, will help you, you know, in identifying relevant material. In this case, we ask different kinds of questions. Like we ask questions like, you know, what topics tend to be most sensitive? Uh, which documents tend to take the longest, you know, to get declassified? And we weren't the first ones to do this kind of research. Um, but, you know, I, I can say that because of the work that we've done, because we've aggregated all this data, we made the whole, you know, collection and our code base as well available. Uh, many more people now uh, can begin studying this and begin drawing their own conclusions, right? Um, I'll just take one example. Uh, it's a fun one. It has to do with UFOs. So I've been following with, with great interest, maybe you have too, Susan, the stories about unidentified uh, aerial phenomena, uh, which is what we now call UFOs. Um, and you know what's striking to me is how the public uh, tends to believe that the government uh, is protecting the information it has about UFOs uh, more closely than maybe any information at all, right? I mean, the U.S. government has given out information about nuclear weapons, you know, covert operations, the drone program, and so on. But somehow we think that they're concealing even more information about UFOs. Well, a data scientist named Hannah Wallach uh, did a really interesting experiment where what she did was she looked at the documents declassified at all those presidential libraries. There's more than 100,000 of them since the 1970s. And she used data science techniques to cluster the documents that are about UFOs and cluster the documents about a whole range of other topics, including nuclear weapons. And Susan, you know what she found? She found that on average, it takes the government about 57 years before it releases a document related to American nuclear weapons or foreign nuclear weapons for that matter. When it comes to UFOs, it's about 14 years. So what we've seen in recent years, you know, with those Navy videos, you know, like the flying Tic Tac, uh, or more recently what's being released now about uh, what appears to be a, a Chinese uh, balloon program, but possibly other things too, that's actually quite typical. For the whole history of the Cold War, the Pentagon and the intelligence community was quite happy to release whatever information they had about unidentified flying objects. And what do you draw from that? Well, I mean, if you only watch Hollywood movies and you never looked at any declassified documents, 
what you think was that, well, the government doesn't want us to panic, right? We, we have to avoid panic. Um, well, I'm telling you, that's not true. <laughs> In fact, over and over again, go back to the 1950s, over and over again, the government has wanted the American people to panic. Uh, whether it was about, you know, the so-called bomber gap, the idea the Soviets were building more nuclear weapons and more bombers than we were, the missile gap, they were building more missiles. Now we're hearing about how there's a balloon gap, <laughs> that the United States should be doing more in near space, right, to counter the Chinese threat. If my, my supposition is this, if the government had ironclad proof that there was an extraterrestrial threat, don't you think they'd want us to know about it? I think they would want us to know about it immediately because how better you know, to drum up even more appropriations than the Pentagon already has, even though it already has you know, more funds available than the next eight countries combined. They have shown an infinite appetite you know, for new weapon systems. And I, I, that's why I think that if they had the proof of UFOs, we would have heard about it quite a while ago. We're at the halfway point in our conversation, and your book is also a book about history. And you make the case that it's really important for people to understand our history, to understand the scope of the current problems with uh, classified documents. You say the country didn't start out this way, that it was founded on a doctrine of radical transparency. What do you mean by that? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, for 150 years, actually, even more, um, the U.S. government was really an outlier compared to other countries. You know, if you look, for example, uh, look at the American military, um, the turn of the century, uh, countries like Portugal, like had a bigger army than the United States of America, right? Uh, even, you know, middle sized countries of, of Europe, like whether we're talking about like the Netherlands uh, or Belgium, they would have black chambers. Uh, what they meant by that was that they would have agencies like our NSA that would intercept and decode communications, whether the communications of, of foreign diplomats or political subversives. The United States, it was the opposite. Not only did we not have any kind of black chamber to intercept private communications, it was a felony to tamper with the mail. For a time, it was a penalty of death, right, for anybody caught tampering with the US mail. Um, so the United States was really an outlier. It also was an outlier in the amount of data that the U.S. government collected, and also even more so in the amount of data that it shared with the American people. So the census is the most famous example of that. I mean, all of us, I think, are familiar with the census, you know, when at least you're supposed to, like, report on, like, who's living in your household and so on. But the census collects enormous amounts of data, and they've been doing it for more than 200 years now. And, you know, go back to the 19th century, they would print out tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of copies of you know the voluminous abstract of the decennial census distribute that free to the american people same with our foreign relations same with our diplomatic correspondence so other countries you know they would encrypt it they would guard it closely the united states in the course of the 19th century stopped encrypting international communications and during the civil war I mean, normally in wartime, that was the only time which the U.S. Would, would build up an espionage apparatus and a surveillance apparatus. So Lincoln did that during the American Civil War. I mean, Lincoln, you know, famously had his spies, right? The U.S. built up an espionage apparatus, of course. But at the same time, you know, Lincoln wanted American diplomacy to be out in the open. And so he started something called the Foreign Relations of the United States, which was an annual report originally written for Congress, where they would reveal all the communications, or almost all the communications with foreign powers. Why? Because Lincoln believed that if the world understood what American diplomats were trying to achieve, then the world would support the Union cause and its efforts to defeat the Confederacy. And so this is an example of how in some ways Lincoln was more radical than Julian Assange. You know, he wanted our diplomatic communications released almost in, in real time. And so in all these ways, the United States had a proud tradition for more than 150 years of being radically transparent and being completely, or at least, you know, in terms of people who could vote, <laughs> which was not everyone, of course, but at least for voters of being completely accountable to voters. And also the government itself, you know, the last part, it was, it was relatively small. You know, the U.S. government until the 20th century was much smaller than that of, of most other uh, countries. And so, you know, if you if you told the founders, right, the first generation, even the second, third generation, if you told them the United States would now have 18 different intelligence agencies and have a, a defense establishment in peacetime, 
right? That's that's bigger budget wise than the next eight countries combined. They would have fallen out of their chairs. They would have been flabbergasted because this was not at all what they envisioned for the United States. With the advent of the 20th century, of course, the challenges became global and uh, the infrastructure then increased to respond to it. But you mark World War II as really the significant turning point in the collection of secrets and uh, and also keeping them secret. Specifically, I, I, I mark this down. You said state archiving and state secrecy in America rose out of the same ground during the same historical moment and for many of the same reasons. Can you explain that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's not usually how we think of archives. Uh, like I think a lot of your viewers have probably visited archives if they've ever gone to the, the Constitution Avenue in Washington on the mall. You see that the original building of the National Archives is where they house the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And maybe some of your viewers also have gone you know, to local libraries and archives or they've gone to presidential libraries. So we typically think of these places as places that welcome visitors, right? Uh, and they're happy to open their doors to the public. But when you think of it, when you go to an archive, typically you're only seeing a fraction of what lies in store. Um, because archives also accumulate lots of information that's not yet public, right? So those 26 Washington monuments worth of paper that's held by the National Archives and Records Administration, those are held in federal record centers that are scattered all across the country. They're not open to the public, not at all. Now, what's in those papers? Well, those are the papers that different departments and agencies decided might be important enough that they had to preserve them permanently. Uh, and historically, the National Archives has estimated that they only preserve about one to three percent of the original documentary record. So the rest of what uh, our government generates in the way of paper records um, is destroyed, right? And it's destroyed after some set number of years, right? It's it's typically whenever the the archivists can get together with the records managers and decide what it is that together they want to preserve for posterity. So archives, when you think about it, you know, they couldn't preserve anything, really, if they didn't decide what it was that was worth preserving and what it is that they, they could safely destroy. Now, what's been happening in recent years, though, is the amount of information that they're accumulating and the amount of information that they're reviewing and releasing to the public have been going off in two completely different directions. So the growth of, of information is increasing exponentially and the amount of information they're releasing to the public has actually been declining. So 20 years ago, a little more, it was around the year 2000, the U.S. National Archives announced that they had declassified more than 200 million pages a year, right? Now they're, de they're declassifying a fifth as much, less than 50 million pages a year, right? So that's why more and more, actually, when you look at archives, you should look at these as places where they protect state secrets and where they end up destroying a lot of records. Now, both of these things are entirely legitimate, but you do have to think about what these archives really represent, which is why I point out that the National Archives itself was created and flourished at the same time the United States was beginning to gear up for the Second World War. And the National Archives, like in its present form, you know, with its responsibility and its authority over the papers of our federal government, that, that really is something that dates only, you know, to that period in the run up to the Second World War. The development of the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, uh, was the first, as you say, full prototype of something you referred to earlier, a special access program where compartmentalization of information was the key to keeping things secret. The example of this being Harry Truman was not even privy to the size of the nuclear arsenal that had been built. So how did compartmentalization grow and what impact does it have on keeping of secrets today? Right, you're right, Susan. The the Manhattan Project was really the prototype, you know, for the system of secrecy that eventually spread all across the government, um, because it was the Manhattan Project where you had, of course, the levels of secrecy. Um, the atomic bomb ex itself was one of the first top secrets. Uh, and General Leslie Groves, as, as soon as he realized that there was a, a classification level more secret than than secret, top secret, he decided everything related, you know, to the uh, uh, Manhattan Project had to be classified at the same level. So you could also see already with the Manhattan Project, the beginning of what we call the inflation of secrecy, right? Where more and more information is getting classified at the highest level. Um, 
Manhattan Project also was the first, you know, you could call it the first SAP, this, the first special access program, because of course there are lots of people who had clearances, you know, at the secret or even top secret level who didn't know about the Manhattan Project. And famously that includes Harry Truman. So even as vice president, you know, he was not privy to the secret of the atomic bomb because Roosevelt himself decided apparently that he didn't have a need to know. Right. So the Manhattan Project is also an example of how, in addition to these layers of secrecy or levels, you also have siloed information. And so when you think of it together, you think about these levels of secrecy and you think about all the different silos, the different special access programs and so on. It looks a bit like a matrix. And what began with the Manhattan Project began to replicate all across the government, where, you know, by the late 1940s, when Harry Truman is trying to pass a new uh, or, or issue a new executive order, um, he's finding that much of the government now is dealing with secret information. You know, even even like obscure departments and agencies and commissions and committees and so on are handling secret information or would like to, right? Even the NLRB, right? The National Labor Relations Board felt it had the need to classify information. So Harry Truman is finding already by the late 1940s, it's starting to, to get out of control. And that's why he thinks anyway, with his new executive order, he might be able to bring things back under control. Well, earlier you identified, of course, the nuclear threat, threat as perhaps the most important thing that, what, that the country wants to keep as top secret, uh, especially today from rogue nations and non-state actors. And you ask in the book, is there a better way to identify the really top secrets of nuclear weapons? Do you have an answer to that question? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, the reason why we gathered all of these millions of declassified documents, the reason why we work with top data scientists, statisticians, and computer scientists, is we wanted to answer that question, like, is there a better way? And I can tell you, Susan, absolutely. Um, even with declassified documents, you know, even with the relatively small grants you know, that we're able to get uh, outside government, we're able to show that, yes, indeed, you know, you can use algorithms to automatically identify uh, records in a collection that might be related to nuclear weapons. Um, you can also, you know, automatically uh, identify the classification level in 90% of cases, right, of a given uh, State Department cable. Now, you might say, well, 90% is not good enough, right? We need to be 100% sure. But then you have to ask yourself the question, well, are humans 100% right all of the time? Uh, and in fact, when you ask government officials, like, have you run the experiment? In academia, we call this an intercoder reliability experiment. You want to see if different people can agree, you know, on how they code uh, information. So in this case, like, have government officials um, run the experiment where they have different officials looking at the same documents, seeing whether they would redact them in the same way or differently. And what you find is that, no, they haven't run the experiment. They don't actually know the level of human error in reviewing and releasing records to the public. So that's why I think we may well find, you know, that uh, humans are, are working at a 90% level as it is. And what we've discovered is the floor and not the ceiling. We've discovered like what we can do now with the technology we have currently, again, you know, outside of government using declassified data. If, you know, government officials and government research programs like DARPA and IARPA uh, were to undertake this kind of project. They, of course, have vastly larger sums of money to devote to such projects. And also they have access to all of the classified information. Every time a government official decides that this or that record needs to be protected, every time they decide this or that sentence or paragraph has to be redacted, what they're doing in effect is creating data. It's what we call training data. And with the enormous amount of training data created every year by thousands of people reviewing and releasing documents or redacting them and withholding them, you could begin training algorithms to make predictions about what information could be safely released and what would have to be withheld. Before we leave this area talking about uh, nuclear secrets, one of the facts in your book that surprised me is the Joint Chiefs and uh, the fact that they keep no records of their meetings and in fact earlier made decisions to destroy some of the ones they've made. What's that all about? Oh, well, I'd love to know more. <laughs> I mean, I'd love somebody to ask, uh, you know, on the record, uh, the next Pentagon briefing, well, why is it the Joint Chiefs keep no records of the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, like the, what it is that they say in the room and so on? 
And why is it none of the records were preserved from the period when they did keep these records? So yeah, I, I find it quite amazing, but I've gotten confirmation from this. Most recently, I was talking to uh, an archivist um, uh, who works in government and who made it their project to try to track down, like surely there must be some copies somewhere. They failed, they couldn't find any copies of these meetings of the Joint Chiefs. I think there are a handful that might have survived, but you can't find any boxes full of these records. Why? Because in the early 1970s, they decided they were gonna destroy all the records of all the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff going back to the beginning, going back to World War II. And I can't help but think, and this is what other people have concluded as well, this was a period after the passage of the Freedom of Information Act, it was the time of the Pentagon Papers. It was around the time or shortly before the Watergate scandal. So people in government were becoming aware of the fact that things that they considered classified, even things that were top secret, might eventually get out to the public. And so they decided to destroy all of those records and then henceforth, they stopped keeping records of their meetings. And so if you find that hard to believe, so do I. <laughs> but there it is. Uh, lo and behold, you know this $800 billion Pentagon uh, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff had decided to run run things as if it were a numbers racket where they didn't want to commit anything to paper. I wish that weren't true, and I'm hoping at some point they can prove me wrong. We have about 15 minutes left in our conversation. I want to talk about presidents and official secrecy. If the current uh, system grew up in the FDR era, you write that every president after FDR campaigned promising greater transparency in governing, uh, but conclude that the modern presidency will not reform itself no matter what any candidate promises you. Why not? Yeah, because I've looked at what every candidate promised, every successful candidate for president, you know, going all the way back. Uh, to the very beginning of this national secrecy complex. And what you find with only one exception, every single president, one way or another, you know, has said, like as Barack Obama said famously, that, that his would be the most transparent administration in history. Uh, and every time we find that, if anything, official secrecy just spins out of control. It gets even worse. And so it was under Barack Obama, for example, you know, that we reached the peak you know, as near as we could estimate anyway, which is not very well. But the absolute peak a number of times officials classified information was in 2012. Uh, it was during Obama's first administration. More people were prosecuted for leaking information to the media uh, under the Espionage Act during the Obama administration than all previous administrations combined. Right. So uh, so I, I think that, you know, if you look at the history, it really bears this out. The same is true, too, uh, of Jimmy Carter. Uh, Bill Clinton, all three of these presidents famously, you know, promised that they were going to change the secrecy system when they took office. And if you look at the statistics, if you look at the data, in every single case after they passed their own executive orders, even more information was getting classified every year. You know, and also you don't even have to just depend on government estimates as, as we have so far anyway, talking about a number of classification actions. You can also look now at, for example, those State Department cables from the 1970s. We have millions of them now that have been declassified. And you, we also have many more where we have the metadata because the text hasn't been released. And so what you could do is you could look at all those millions of State Department cables from the 70s, and you can compare the Nixon administration, the Ford administration, the Carter administration. And what I can tell you, Susan, is there's almost no change. You know, State Department Foreign Service officers were classifying information, if anything, even more so, you know, during the Carter years, this era of so-called transparency, than they were during the time of, of Nixon, Kissinger, and Ford. So yes, I've, I've gotten quite skeptical of how it is presidential candidates promise that they're going to reform the system. And that's why I've come to believe that only Congress, through the force of law, and only the courts by a willingness to interpret the law on behalf of the American people, that is the only thing that's actually going to bring about change in this system that's now completely out of control. When you began your answer, you said, with one exception. Well, who was the exception of, in among oh, presidents? Yeah, it was Ronald Reagan. Uh, Reagan, when he came into office, uh, he said that his predecessor, Jimmy Carter, had been too free and easy you know, with national security information. The specific example was the stealth bomber. You know, so Carter, you know, uh, announced that he wasn't going to develop the B-1 bomber. He thought it was a turkey and it was throwing good money after bad if they kept putting money into this B-1 Lancer. Uh, he said that the U.S. had better technology and it was now going to focus on bringing uh, stealth bombers. Uh, 
uh, to, to fruition. So Reagan uh, made a big point when he was campaigning of saying that he was going to be more careful with America's national security information. Now, having said that, you know, when he took office and he began to develop his own executive order, his advisors found that one of the things that Carter was most famous for, the reform, you know, that was really novel under the Carter administration was that for the first time, officials were told they were going to have to weigh the benefit of the public having information that would otherwise be classified against the risk of uh, that information harming national security. So for the first time <laughs> in the 1970s, we're gonna have to decide like, well, maybe you know there is some risk here, but maybe it's outweighed by the benefit of the public having this information, knowing what the government is doing. Now, when Reagan took office, his advisors looked into it, they could not find one example of a judge uh, deciding that under the Freedom of Information Act, that people are going to be entitled to see information because of that balancing test. So whatever you know, Carter put into that executive order, uh, his officials figured out ways of, of ignoring it. So we have one more clip in the nine minutes we have left, and this is Avril Haines just uh, this year, or last year, May 20th, uh, May 10th, 2022, uh, talking about classification of documents. Let's listen. Do you think that overclassification is a national security problem? I do, Senator. I'm, I've stated this explicitly. I do think it's a challenge. I, it, as long as I've been in government, frankly, there have been blue ribbon commissions that have looked at this, have said there's significant overclassification. This is a challenge, as you indicate, from a democratic perspective, but it's also a challenge from a national security perspective, because if we can't share information as easily as we might otherwise be, if it were appropriately classified, then that obviously affects our capacity to work on these issues. So here we have the head of the CIA saying overclassification is a huge problem, including a national security risk. But you referenced that this, the solution to this really does have to come from Congress. Earlier, we learned from you that Congress isn't giving the National Archives enough money. Uh, the infrastructure hasn't been updated in order to process uh, and stay up with technology. So what's been the attitude in Congress about all of this? Uh, they raised the concern, but where's the follow through? Where's the, the level of action on this issue? Well, I've been gratified recently to learn that there is action in Congress now. Uh, there are plans uh, to hold hearings. Um, and, you know, believe it or not, this may be one of these rare examples of an issue where you can find both Democratic and Republican legislators um, who are ready to take on the White House, right? If, that, if that's what it takes in order to bring about real change. Um, now, I really appreciate, let me just make sure to, to emphasize how much I appreciate how um, Avril Haines, you know, has has spoken out on this. Uh, in that case, he was answering a question in Congress, right, from uh, Elizabeth Warren. And uh, I'd love for Senator Warren and others to keep asking those questions, because as our own director of national intelligence points out, it's not as simple as, you know, weighing the national security against democratic accountability. When this system is out of control, when they, they can't share information with allies, when they can't even, different intelligence agencies can't even share it with each other, which is what happened in the run-up to the 9-11 attacks. It's one of the main reasons why we suffered that terrible attack that day. Then you could see how, in fact, it undermines national security. You know, so so excessive state secrecy is also, you know, putting American lives at risk. Uh, so I'd like to see more action in Congress, and I think it's going to be absolutely necessary. I'll give you one other example. I was listening the other day to uh, an interview uh, with Leon Panetta. And um, uh, he was talking in much the same way as, as Avril Haines did. He says, oh, yes, you know, it's notorious. Everybody in government will tell you this. Far too much information is kept secret. You know, we need to be doing more to make sure the American public are aware of what their, their elected representatives are doing. But then I asked myself, Leon Panetta came to Washington in the 1970s. You know, he was a congressman in the Carter administration. He went on to be, you know, he was the chief of staff under, under Bill Clinton. You know, for a time, uh, he was the head of OMB, Office of Management and Budget. Um, he was also the, sec the uh, Secretary of Defense. He was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. So I have to ask myself, you know, Secretary Panetta, what were you doing for 50 years? <laughs> like, if, if you knew this was a notorious problem, then, then please show us your record. Like, what did you do to try to fix this? And, you know, in terms of what Avril Haines is saying now, I'll just say what Joe Biden said. You know, if you want to show us that you really value a transparency and accountability and reducing state secrecy, show us your budget, right? What is the government spending 
on de t developing new technology for declassification. What is the government willing to appropriate to the National Archives so it can finally do the people's business in preserving a public record? So that's when I'm going to believe it, when they start putting their money where their mouths are. We haven't talked about this except in reference to Barack Obama pursuing people, but when this system doesn't work, what is the role of journalists in ferreting out information in our society? Oh, it's incredibly important. You know, it's, it's often said, right, that journalism is like the first draft of history. I have the great luxury, you know, as an historian, I come along years, sometimes decades later, I get to see, or at least I'm supposed to see a lot more information than the journalists see. But I could tell you, when you look at the scholarship historians have been producing in recent years, what you notice is that whereas back when I was in graduate school, when I was starting out, many, many of us were working on history of, of things that happened 30, 40 years before. Now, very few historians are trying to write the history of the 1990s, right? Even though we know that this is important, right? This is an incredibly important period of American history, you know, with NATO expansion, the first, like, what we now call complex emergencies. Uh, like, this is a really imp relevant period of history for us to, to understand, to try to understand our own time. But almost nobody is studying it because there are almost no declassified documents. Like the CIA has almost shut down their, their declassification program. The State Department produces far fewer documents now, declassified documents as part of the Foreign Relations United States series than it did produce for the 1950s and 60s. So it's almost as if like our very recent history is like an undiscovered country. And that being the case, it could be that journalists, not just writing the first draft of history, that may be all we'll ever know. You know, is, is what officials are willing to leak or what it is at least some of them write up in their in their memoirs. So the role of journalists has gotten more important than ever. But I'd like to think that historians will still have a role to play as well. And none of that is going to happen unless we start supporting our archivists and our librarians who do this unglamorous but absolutely essential work on behalf of the entire American people. We're on the verge, or we're learning that we're on the verge of new technology, the AI chat programs changing mm -hmm the processing of information as we know it. What do you see its possible impact on the issues you've raised? Oh, it could be fundamental. Uh, you know, we've been using, in my lab, we use techniques like topic modeling, named entity recognition, things like word embeddings. Those in your audience who know a little bit about data science, they know that, you know, these are like cutting edge technologies uh, just 10, 20 years ago in this field called natural language processing, where we, we look at text like words and we use it as, as data. But ChatGPT and the large language models generally, um, this is the bright, shiny new object, right? Uh, and there's a reason why now there are hundreds of startups like, going into the business of finding new applications for large language models. What I think is going to be really interesting, you can't do this currently with ChatGPT, but if you ask ChatGPT, like, what are America's top secrets? It will say, because I'm sure their lawyers thought of this, it will say that ChatGPT was not trained on classified information. But it would not be impossible at all, you know, to train a large language model on declassified information or potentially on leaked information like like WikiLeaks and the Afghan war war logs. And so I'm quite confident that uh, bad actors are doing that even now. Uh, and I think it remains to be seen what will come out of uh, these large language models trained on that kind of data. Uh, and of course, in the same way that ChatGPT sometimes hallucinates, you know, gives you wrong information, so too will these new uh, projects. But I think it's really important that our government get ahead of this. And I would hope that they are investing time and, and money in developing this technology. So at least we could do some threat modeling to see what's possible. As we close, you have a somewhat dark warning for country and your readers particularly, the exponential growth of information, much of it secret, all of it perishable, threatens history itself. So what's the warning that you're giving to us? Yeah, I'll try to end on a, on a cheerier note. <laughs> Because like, as a historian, like, it is depressing. You know, it, it's sad, right, when you look at what's happening at the National Archives compared to what I experienced when I was starting out as a student. Um, I think all of us, you know, should not be just sad. We should be upset and angry, and we should be writing to our congressmen insisting that they support our history, our heritage. And if they don't, you know, then it, it's true. I mean, the history as we know it uh, is passing away. Now, having said that, um, it doesn't mean historians are just going to give up. Um, there are other historians like me working with our colleagues in data science and other social sciences too. And we are trying to do what we can with the data that we have.
And I can tell you that even if we're only getting a very partial view into what was originally classified, what we're seeing is already amazing. I mean, it's quite extraordinary uh, what you can learn using uh, machine learning algorithms and using it even on declassified documents. You really can learn, you know, what was the information protected most closely by our government. You can learn, you know, who are the people who are most likely to be redacted from the original, original record. Uh, you can find too, like which officials tend to be in the room talking about things that even now uh, the American people are not allowed to know. Uh, the short answer is Henry Kissinger, by the way. But <laughs> but you can learn all these things and much, much more. And and I'm happy to tell you that there are many more historians and data scientists now too that are beginning to wake up and see this potential. So there's really quite a lot we can learn about our society, about our history, about our world. And, and I'm here to tell you that that's exciting. So so it's exciting, there's a huge potential, but we can't do it if we don't have the data to work with. And that's why we need our national archives. And we need the American people and American Congress to support them. Matthew Connolly's new book, The Declassification Engine, What History Reveals About America's Top Secrets. Thanks so much for spending an hour with us. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.